It began on a dark and stormy night. The wind was howling, the lightning was flashing, the thunder was cracking, and Luigi Galvani was climbing to the roof of his house with a dead frog and a long metal wire. You see, he was consumed with this idea that the frog was powered by some kind of animal electricity. And if he could just recharge it with electricity from the lightning, then maybe, just maybe, the dead creature would show signs of life. So he took the wire, plugged one end into the frog, and he pointed the other end towards the heavens. <laughs> and he waited, and he waited. And in an instant, a bolt of lightning streaked across the sky, and he stared in wide-eyed wonder as the frog's legs began to kick. Now, at that time, he had a rivalry with a local professor named Alessandro Volta. And Volta had heard about the success of these experiments, and to the great disappointment of the local frog population, decided to reproduce them. <laughs> but Volta saw things differently. To him, the frog was not some container of animal electricity, but simply responding to the presence of an electric current. What's more, he found that if you take two wires of different metals and connect that to the frog, it also kicks. Could it be that electricity comes from some chemical difference in the metals? To test his idea, he replaced the frog with saltwater-soaked cardboard and piled layers of zinc and cardboard and copper together into a stack. And he knew he was onto something big when he brought the leads together and a spark flashed between them. That invention in 1799 was the world's first electric battery. Now, I'm a battery scientist, and I was working in the field for like five years before I heard that story. And I was amazed, you know, not only because it's a great story, but in all of the classes and the seminars and the conferences that I've been to, nobody ever led with it. Well, that's an injustice that we have uh, fixed here tonight. But uh, I'm a scientist, I would do research in computational electrochemistry, which basically means that I use artificial intelligence and computers and very fancy advanced mathematics to try to build better batteries. And most days when I give talks, they tend to feature a lot of very long and very fancy and very squiggly equations. But today is not most days. <laughs> And a sigh of relief permeates the audience, right? Uh, no, today is not most days. Today, I would like to talk about change and the people who make it uh, in the world. So uh, I lead with the, the frog story because it is a great example of how big and meaningful change can often come from small things that may seem silly or even a little bit crazy, you know? I mean, even now, more than 200 years later, we can still kind of hear Galvani's neighbor's disapproval, you know. Honey, he's at it again. Crazy old Galvani's up on his roof in a lightning storm. Didn't I tell you kids to stop bringing him frogs? <laughs> but say what you will about their methods. Uh, Galvani and Volta had courage. They had courage to think, they had courage to create, and that courage changed the world. Of course, today we live in a world that is changing whether we like it or not. It's easy to see on the evening news, right? I mean, climate change, war, famine, energy, inflation. I mean, my goodness gracious, it is enough to almost make you want to take a nap and binge a series. And it's easy to feel hopeless and want to just look away. But it's exactly when it's hardest to look that we know that we really have to. And we're not powerless in this, right? I mean, we're all still here, we're all still kicking, and as long as that is true, then we also have a choice. And we can choose to think differently and to lead towards a more sustainable future. The green transition is one path that gets us there. It's a model for sustainable growth based on renewable energy and the conservation of natural resources. And of course, you've heard this before, right? It's nothing new. But it's usually presented as our burden of responsibility to future generations or to uh, you know, exotic endangered species in far-flung places of the globe. And it is, but it isn't. 
It's also about us helping ourselves right here, right now. And here's how. Uh, I grew up in Georgia uh, on the banks of the Chattahoochee River. It's a beautiful place that is the inspiration for countless classic songs. You know, I mean, Georgia on my mind, the midnight train to Georgia. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, but I think it's best described for the purposes of this talk by our great poet, Alan Jackson, who said of it, way down yonder on the Chattahoochee, it gets hotter than a hoochie coochie. <laughs> it's the kind of place where we have a love affair with big pickup trucks. And I'm no exception. Uh, my first car was a Ford F-150. And there is something romantic about it, right? I mean, driving down country roads with your dog and your truck, you know, it's freedom. It's self-determination. It's cliche for a reason. And if you need any more convincing that we have a very deep-seated, borderline unhealthy love of big gas-guzzling trucks, I'll tell you this. The first time I was in traffic with my Norwegian partner, we found it impossible to ignore the cultural phenomenon that is truck nuts. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. It's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> The point is that uh, it's not necessarily the kind of place that would spring first to mind when you think about leaders in uh, electric vehicles or renewable energy, but it is. Georgia is one of the fastest growing markets for electric vehicles in the United States. And they're not just buying them, they're making them. We've invested billions and billions of dollars in the battery and electric vehicle industry, and it employs tens of thousands of people, not to mention being a leader in new installations of solar energy systems. So what's going on? What's the deal? The green transition is successful in Georgia for one reason. It works. It doesn't work because it's mandated. It doesn't work because it uh, makes you feel good. It works because it helps people to live healthier, happier, and more prosperous lives. And that's something that has long fascinated thinkers. You know, what is it that makes uh, people's lives healthy, happy, and, and prosperous? Uh, Benjamin Franklin, you know, tried to answer that question in his famous quote. You probably know it, right? Uh, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Yes, nice. Uh, and, you know, I think that's true. Um, the, uh, aside from the, the early to rise part, I'm not a big fan of that one. Uh, but aside from a good night's sleep, researchers have found that across nations, across cultures, there's one common denominator, and that's education, especially education of women and girls. I'll tell you another story. In southern Africa, there's a beautiful country called Mozambique, that has long suffered through horrific conflicts. Uh, first a war of independence, and then a bloody civil war, and uh, now an insurgency. And of the many tragic consequences of that, uh, one of them is this, that many people never got the chance to go to school and cannot read or write. Uh, I've spent many years traveling through villages in uh, northern Mozambique training solar energy technicians. And many of these uh, villages are so isolated, you know, that they are in places that are only accessible by uh, foot or by boat in the rainy season. And uh, there's no grid connection. It's not really feasible to haul in enough diesel for a generator, but solar energy offers a solution. So working together with uh, local schools, we train uh, technicians to install small, solar and battery systems. And that had the effect of bringing, for the first time, electric light into classrooms and allowing uh, schools to offer nighttime classes for adults. And after five years, there were adult literacy programs in dozens of communities across the region. So the point is that the green transition is not just about uh, technical innovations, it's not just about financial success, it's also about people and helping people to reach their full potential 
sends positive ripples throughout society that we all can benefit from. So at this point, I hope I've been able to convince you that the green technology or the green transition is a good thing, uh, that it is not a burden, but an opportunity for people all over the world, and that it should continue. Uh, what do we need to do that? What do we need to make that happen? Well, uh, what powers the electric vehicles? Batteries. What stores the solar energy? Batteries. Mostly, it's one special kind of battery called the lithium ion battery. Uh, it's what's in your phone, it's what's in your laptop computer, it won a Nobel Prize, it is the, the fuel of the green transition. But there's a problem. There are not enough materials in the world to build all of the lithium ion batteries that we're going to need for the next 50 to 100 years. And many of the materials that do exist are located in just a few countries. So we need to find something uh, new and we need to find it fast. Since the days of Galvani and Volta, battery development has been basically a trial and error endeavor. Uh, developers will change one material and you know, look for different combinations until something works. And it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You, know, you fix this problem and this one pops up, you get that one and it's this one over here, and it gets the job done, but it just takes forever. You know? uh, the lithium ion battery, the Nobel Prize winning fuel of the green economy, took 40 years to go from concept to accepted product. And we don't have that kind of time. We are in a race, and we need to build a deep bench of new battery technology fast. So how are we going to do that? Well, as battery scientists, we are throwing everything that we've got at this problem. I mean, we have dialed it up to 11. We're building artificial intelligence platforms combined with high-performance computing clusters that can scan through the seemingly infinite space of materials compositions to look for new materials. We're using advanced mathematics to try to simulate how those materials behave in cells and even building uh, robotic platforms that can build, uh, test, and uh, design their own cells all without uh, human intervention. There has never been more people, uh, computers, machines, all pushing for a breakthrough in battery technology than there is today. And it's already paying dividends, right? Car makers are starting to bring uh, new technologies like sodium ion batteries and solid state batteries one step closer to commercialization. We're having the courage to start thinking differently and exploring new concepts of you know, batteries that use seawater and batteries that can breathe. It's a time where we can really feel hopeful about the future of battery technology. But like any race, there's always people who tend to jump the gun, right? Uh, you hear about it a lot, usually on a slow news day, uh, where you'll read something like, you know, new battery technology charges in 10 seconds and goes 1,000 miles. It's a good, a good uh, rule for life, that if something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. But we are making steady progress, and uh, it's an exciting time to be working in, in the battery field. But is it enough? You know? Can any of us really affect change in the world? Uh, and when I think that way, sometimes I think back to Galvani uh, sitting on his roof in the rain. Uh, he had nothing, just a box of frogs. And he managed to set off a spark that still shakes our world today. I mean, y'all, look around. We have everything. What can we do to help build a better world? I build batteries. That's my box of frogs. My partner is uh, passionate about plastic pollution, and she will stop the car to pick up trash on the side of the road. That's her box of frogs. David Attenborough makes nature documentaries. Dolly Parton uses her fortune to send books to children. Malala goes to school. Greta Thunberg goes to school strikes. Those are their boxes of frogs. So in the end, uh, my idea worth sharing is this. Go find your box of frogs and come help us change the world. Thank you.